Thank you very much, Nancy. It's a pleasure to be with you and CGD. It's a pleasure to see again my old finance minister colleague, uh, Trevor Manuel, after some number of years to again be in a conversation with Donald Kabaruka, who did so much uh, as the head of the African Development Bank and to be engaged in dialogue with my friend uh, Tijan, who I've known for uh, so many years, along with the other distinguished colleagues on uh, this panel. I am not entirely sure why I am here. Everyone else on this panel is a distinguished African and a distinguished expert on matters relating to uh, the African uh, economy. I am uh, neither of those things. So I speak uh, with great um, and perhaps uncharacteristic uh, humility. Let me uh, just make a few observations. First, the US election will be enormously consequential for all the outcomes that we are discussing and enormously consequential far beyond uh, issues of African economic development. This is by far the most consequential US election in my lifetime. And the global system that most of us know, all of us know, and most of us for all its flaws greatly value is very much at stake in the context of uh, the current uh, election. Um, issues that are near impossible in the current political context will become quite easy, I predict, in the context of a change in the US government. I think, for example, of SDRs. I think, for example, of uh, freeing up of lending from uh, the development institutions. I think, for example, of generous approaches to uh, foreign assistance. Second uh, observation, there is an overwhelming case for a substantial increase in uh, the resource commitment to Africa, to emerging markets, and the developing world uh, more uh, broadly. One has to be struck by the extraordinary and unique boldness of the domestic response in the United States, Europe, and Japan to this crisis, and the timidity, uh, tepidity, and timorousness of the international global response for uh, developing countries. Let us not be confused about uh, what is at stake. The defining reality for thinking about economic development of the first 35 years after the Second World War was divergence. Rich countries grew faster than poor countries and the gap between them widened. The defining reality for the last 35 uh, years has been convergence as developing countries have grown, rap grown more rapidly than industrial countries and have closed uh, the gap. That is why the last 30 years have seen more progress for more human beings than any 30 years in human history. What is at stake in the next years is whether that process of convergence can continue and does continue. It is under threat, yes, from uh, the pandemic. It is under threat, yes, from concerns about uh, international trade. It is under threat from technological developments that may tend to concentrate production and economic activity in previously prosperous hubs that already have agglomeration economies. But above all, 
it is under threat from a politics of an unfettered return to economic nationalism. And what is at stake is the idea of global community. And there can be no global community without a strong African presence, without Africans doing their part to grow, prosper, and enter the global community, and without the global community responding. How we respond in response to COVID will be an immense test of all of that. Third observation, there's a word that has been strikingly, at least to my mind, absent from uh, the dialogue so far, and that is China. China has an immense presence on the African continent. China has extended immense loans to the African continent. China has judged itself to have a substantial economic stake in developments on the African continent. There is room to debate whether Chinese policies reflect a enlightened, if non-Western, approach to promoting economic development in the mutual interest of all, or whether there is an element of selfish exploitation, debt trap, diploma, debt trap diplomacy, subversion of positive trends implicit in China's economic activity. That is a debate for experts with much more texture of experience on the African continent than I have to participate in. What it seems to me is unquestionable is that reflection on Africa's economic future must involve China as a central player. Chinese money, Chinese technology, Chinese debt uh, collection, all of this will be uh, central. And I do not presume to judge or evaluate these issues beyond making this observation. For the West, for the traditional international financial institutions, to cede relevance in Africa to China would be to take a remarkably short-sighted view of our own interests would be to weaken the position of Africa and would be a tragic error of historic proportions. Again, I do not presume to judge how all this should work out, but we cannot any longer suppose that the dialogues that normally take place in the G7 or within the international financial institutions constitute a dialogue among all the important external actors with respect to the African continent. And I don't think that is an idea that has been fully recognized uh, in the city of Washington. Fourth, what, what should be done? One, it, A, it is a no-brainer that an SDR allocation should be passed. My own preference would be to pass two $500 billion SDR allocations staggered over a period of a, of a year or two so as to avoid the need for US uh, congressional approval. Two, that, uh, you, that SDR allocation should be associated with an agreement among willing parties to reallocate the SDRs for uh, the African uh, continent. Three, 
the World Bank should and the other development banks should come into the 21st century in terms of their financial engineering. It should be recognized that levels of leverage that are uh, that have evolved substantially in the private sector in recognition of the remarkably low level of interest rates need to be expanded within at least most of the developing development banks. I am confident that it is, as CGD research has convincingly demonstrated, that it would be possible to substantially increase lending limits from the World Bank without putting the health of the World Bank in jeopardy. I suspect that the same is true for at least some of the other major development banks. Fourth, there needs to be a recognition, and this would be a good, very valuable thing uh, for CGD research to document in detail, of the reduction in the value of concessional assistance associated with low interest rates. A zero interest rate loan when the treasury rate was 6% for 30 years was a very substantial grant in present value terms. When zero interest rate loans are provided at a time when SDR interest rates are close to zero, the concessional element is far smaller. There is no reason why all of that reduction should be enjoyed by the donor countries and none should benefit uh, no, and none of it should benefit the recipient uh, countries. Concessional aid calculations should reflect the reduction in concessionality associated with uh, declining uh, interest rates. Fifth, the world needs to organize itself around global health. Yes, as I've told global health groups, when there is a new major crisis in the sphere of global health, inevitably, as vital as it is, a portion of the resources are going to have to come from ongoing and existing global health priorities. But there is no reason why that should be the main or primary or large scale source of financing for the enhanced global effort, global health effort that uh, COVID demands. Malaria relief is no less a priority today than it was a year ago. The same can be said with respect to tuberculosis. The same can be said uh, with uh, respect uh, to AIDS. The world needs to be prepared to step up in a cooperative way to meet the global health challenge. When future historians evaluate the morality of this moment, who got vaccines when? And how linked was that to poverty will be a question on which moral historians uh, will judge us. Finally, there is a critical case, not on large scale tomorrow, but there is a high likelihood that over time, substantial debt relief will be necessary for the most affected uh, and indebted countries. How much and in what way will depend upon how the virus evolves and will depend on how the global economy uh, evolves. But these things take time and now is the time to begin planning for the kind of comprehensive, though case-by-case, -case, approach to debt relief that was successfully implemented 
around the time of uh, the millennium and is likely to be necessary again. I have been engaged in matters of international financial diplomacy now for a generation. I can think of many cases in which debt relief was delivered too late, in which failures of realism, failures of recognizing reality led to burdensome, costly debt overhangs that affected the health and education of millions of people. I am not aware of a single instance in which observers have looked back and said debt relief was premature, debt relief was excessive. And that is a lesson that we need to heed as we think about debt relief for Africa going forward. Let me end where I began. For better or for worse, for fairer or for less fair. Much of this is going to depend on decisions that are made in the United States. And as President Obama said in a very different, very different context, elections have consequences. And how Africa is responded to at this crucial moment will be one of the consequences of the US election. Thank you for the chance to be with you.